Hello and welcome to chapter 28. Uh, today we're going to talk about filler metal selection. So this chapter covers a lot of ground. Um, Sharpie testing, tensile testing, carbon equivalency calculations, decoding filler metals, and hydrogen related weld problems. So it's going to be key that you watch the supporting videos that I've embedded in the lesson. Um, especially the tensile testing one because I, I think that's a real key key thing to understand. Um, and anything you're not you're not really understanding, come to us for clarification. We, we'd be more than happy to spend some time with you helping you understand this stuff because this is, this is critical information for you. Um, so this is going to be a long one, so I'm going to get started. So let's talk about Sharpie testing. Sharpie, C-H-A-R-P-Y. Sharpie is a way we test steels for impact toughness, usually at low temperatures. Um, the videos will show pretty well. What you do is you... Um, Got a block of steel, you've got it in a fixture, um, usually there'll be a cutter notch in it, and this big hammer comes down and hits it, actually it probably hits from that direction, um, and everything's calibrated, and it determines at what foot-pounds that steel breaks at. Um, that's a really key factor that welders need to know because what we don't want to build are um, brittle structures. We want structures to bend. We don't want them to fracture. Um, and the Sharpie test gives a really good idea of how tough the weld is going to be and how it's going to act in service. The low temperature aspect is key too because some of the stuff we build is going to be in low, low temperature conditions. And you start looking at Sharpie numbers and there's a huge difference between you know two Hobart flux core fillers not only is there a big difference in Sharpie values between the two fillers, there's a big difference in Sharpie values depending on what um, cover gas you use. CO2 will generally give you the, the best impact toughness. Um, C25 will give you less impact toughness. So that's stuff we all we need to think about when we're um, when we're deciding what filler to use. Um, tensile testing. Tensile testing is, is a really key, for me, a really key thing about steel because it tells us so much. Um, what a tensile test is, I'm going to draw a really, uh, another really crappy picture. What a tensile test is, is you, you make a steel weld coupon, usually, sometimes it's just the material, sometimes it is a welded specimen, and then you put in a big machine and you pull it this way and you see where it breaks. But not only you're seeing where it breaks, you're, you're going to see a lot of stuff about it. The video um, linked in the chapter is really good. So watch it. But what, what ends up with is they chart the pull on this. So they've got a, a graph. And here is um, force. So how many pounds they're pulling. And here is um, elongation. Which is how, how the part is stretching. And what the curve on most steels looks like is you'll have a a long straight section and this is its elasticity. Anywhere along this, this straight section if, if we release um, that force it will spring back to its original state. That is within its elastic limit. Then it, at, at one point up at the top it will do that number. This right here is its yield point. At this point any farther, any more force we give it, it will not spring back to its original shape. We are deforming it. And what I've talked about before is, is when we're working with steel and designing steel structures, we never want to work past this point because this is failure. You know, if I build a trailer and I'm working out here um, in this range, if I put enough weight on it in this range, I'm going to bend the trailer, break something, it's going to fail. We don't want to work in this range because this is we're going to have to replace these parts because they are no longer the same. We want to work in this elastic limit. Um, and that's the other thing too is is when they classify steel, they a lot of times they classify it by tensile. Tensile is the highest point on this curve out here, um, which is its maximum strength. Um, nowadays, a lot of times they'll do it by yield because that's a lot more telling to people designing structures. So anyway. This is its yield point. This is also known as its elastic limit. What will happen is it will hit the yield point, it will start to move pretty easy and then it will start to get hard to move again and this is the, the material actually work hardening. 
as you're pulling it, as this is getting longer, it's actually getting harder. And it's getting harder and harder to pull. And there'll be the maximum tensile, and then after that, it will neck down enough, this will get skinny enough, it will get easier and easier to pull, and then it'll break. So anyway, watch the video, they do a lot better job explaining it than I do, but, but tensile tests are incredible because they tell us so much. They tell us it's elastic limit, it's yield point, it's maximum tensile, stuff a welder needs to know. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is carbon equivalency of steel um, for, for materials that have a lot of alloying elements that aren't just carbon steel. Um, we talked about 4140 before, which is chromoly steel. Um, from the four digit um, SAE designator, we know it is 0.40% carbon, um, which is weldable, totally weldable, but, but getting in the, in the medium carbon is getting to the point where we really have to kind of think about what we're doing with it. Um, but that doesn't tell the whole story because it's a chromoly steel, which means it's got uh, molybdenum and chromium, chromium in it. And that will play a role in its weldability too. And don't freak out about math. Um, carbon equivalency to calculation equals the percent carbon plus percent manganese or part, yeah, plus percent silicon divided by six um, plus percent chromium plus percent moly plus percent vanadium all divided by five plus percent copper plus percent nickel divided by 15. So these different divisors give you an idea of how, how much each one of these play. Um, and you do all this math and you end up with the carbon equivalency. Um, and for 4140, if I remember correctly, that carbon equivalency ends up being like 0.6, 0.7% carbon. So it acts like, like 0.65 approximately percent, which is getting to the point where it's not weldable. Now, 4140 is totally weldable, but this doesn't give us the true the true idea. This is the true idea. This is how careful we have to be with it, because um, steel that's above this is right out of the American Weld Society. Um, Carbon equivalency above 0.4, there's pinch for, for heat affected zone or flame cut edge cracking. So we have to be really careful with it. So, carbon equivalency. You will probably never have to do a carbon equivalency calculation, but you need to understand the whole gist of this is that we can't judge a book by its cover and a lot more than just carbon plane to weldability. But carbon is so important, carbon content is so important, we relate all of those different things to carbon content. Clear as mud. Um, so now we're going to talk about decoding filler metals. Um, we're going to start with the common one, which is 7018. So, SMAW. I'm going to erase this stuff up here so I have more room to work. So, SMAW. 7018. So how do we decode this? Um, stick is pretty easy. It doesn't have a lot of crazy stuff going on with it. Pretty much any um, filler metal we use, and this, this is E7018, this E is going to stand for electrode. This right here, the next two digits, is going to be tensile. Strength of the finished weld. This one is going to be position. Number one is all position. And eight is going to be um, basically all the other information. It's going to be slag type, or flux type, I should say. Flux type and operation. 
this will tell us polarity, it'll tell us the flux type 8 is low hydrogen with iron powder in the flux. So E7018 electrode, 70,000 tensile for the finished weld, all position, low hydrogen, iron powder in the flux. Um, E6010, what's the tensile? 60,000 tensile, so it's less strong. Um, but it is all position. And the zero tells you it is a rutile flux, sailor's flux, can't remember. Um, but it tells you the flux. Um, something like 7024, it is also 70 tensile. This two means it is um, flat and horizontal only. And the four is the flux type. It is not low is the flux type. It is not low hydrogen. If it's low hydrogen, it's only five, six, and eight. It's not low hydrogen, but what the four tells us is there's a ton of iron in the flux. So that's how we decode stick electrode designators. Let's talk about um, GMAW. GMAW is also fairly easy. So GMAW. Typical one we use is very common. Let me get my cord out of the way. Very common is going to be um, ER seventy S dash six. So E is electrode. R means rod, and what that means is we can use this for TIG filler or oxy fuel filler as well. So it's electrode or rod. Um, seventy again, seventy k tensile. The S means it's solid wire. And this 6 tells us um, about what kind of coating the wire has. This is usually level of the oxidizer. Um, TIG filler, we usually run less. 6 is a very fairly high level of the oxidizer, and that stuff they add to the wire to almost acts as a, acts as a flux, like, like um, a flux process, where it'll go in and scavenge and bond to stuff and um, clean the weld out, make a, a better weld, and allow you to get away with welding on a little mill scale and a little schmutz. But... Um, usually TIG filler we don't run that much usually TIG filler we use will be R70 S2 or S3 but your mileage may vary uh, let's talk about FCAW so FCAW gets kind of complicated there's a lot going on with flex core wires so the the common one we use is probably the most common wire in the world. Um, I shouldn't say that. Hobart Excelarc 71. I think they changed the name to Fabco Excelarc 71. The designator for that, and that's what we use, is, and this is dual shielded, is um, E71 T1. C slash M H eight. Okay, so let's just let's work in steps here. So flux core, there's a bunch of different flux cores, not only inner shielded but or not only dual shielded but inner shielded. E again is electrode. Seven in this in this time we don't use two numbers to designate. We only use a single. This isn't seventy one k tensile. This is seventy k tensile. The one is again position. Um, and this is all position. The T means it's a tubular wire. I've got, one of the things I'm going to link in the lesson is um, Lincoln has a really good decoder. I've got the link on the web page um, to let you work through this stuff. So this one is usability. Um, specific requirements po for polarity and operating conditions. Um, this is basically additional info. It'll tell you if it's DCEN, DCEP, yada yada yada. The CM is actually gas. The C means it's carbon dioxide only. The M means it's mixed gas, so like a C25. So the C-M means we can use either. Some of them are only going to be C, some of them are only going to be M, some of them won't have this at all, and that is the inner shielded stuff. 
Okay. Um, H8 is, we also see that in 7018. And what H8 is, is it's telling us how much, how much hydrogen ends up in the finished weld. Okay, and we'll talk about hydrogen in just a second, but it's a big deal. Hydrogen is, is a really big problem for welds. And what this is telling us is how many milligrams per, I want to say 100 grams of hydrogen in the weld. So this is 8 milligrams per 100 grams. Um, the lower number for hydrogen always better. You can buy H4. It costs more because they got to get more hydrogen out of it. You can also buy H16. Um, it costs less because there's more hydrogen in it. A lot of the 7018 we run is E7018, like H8R, H4R. That H4 or H8 is telling you hydrogen content. Um, but flux cores, flux cores complicated. There's a lot going on. Um, let's see. Let's talk about hydrogen. So we just talked about how we thought or how we rate it in a in a filler rod. Let's talk about why hydrogen is a problem. So if you guys remember back to your periodic tables in chemistry class, hydrogen is number one. Hydrogen is the smallest atom there is. Is the smallest atom there is, um, and it's everywhere. The problem with hydrogen is it's so small that it will get um, it will get in between the grain boundaries of the steel. Uh, remember we talked about heat affected zones, and we've got we've got really fine grain metal in here. We got really fine grain metal out here, but in here in this heat affected zone, we got these these big lumpy grains because we've overheated the metal and cooled it too quickly sometimes. Well, hydrogen will get in these in between these these grain boundaries and create cracks and weld failure. So this is straight from Lincoln Electric. So hydrogen contributes to de delayed weld and or heat affected zone cracking. Hydrogen combined with high residual stresses and crack sensitive steel may result in cracking hours or days after the welding has been completed. High strength steels, thick sections, and heavily restrained parts are more susceptible to hydrogen cracking. On these materials, we recommend using a low hydrogen process and consumable, following proper preheat interpass and preheat procedures. So hydrogen's a big deal. Um, the other thing they say is, also it is important to keep the weld joint free of oil, rust, paint, and moisture as these are sources of hydrogen. So when you preheat something with a torch, you go to cut something with a torch, what do you see when you put the torch on it? You see moisture flash off of it, just condensation out of the air. If we don't do a little bit of preheat, that will be in our weld, and that will put hydrogen into our weld. Okay, what what else could be a source of hydrogen? Um, hydrocarbons, oil. That's why it's so key to get all the oil off of parts before you weld them, because if there's any oil on the on the parts, you'll have no control over the hydrogen. You'll have you'll have way too much hydrogen because it'll come out of those hydrocarbons. Um, Moisture not just on the steel, but wet 7018. If you have 7018 that's been left out in the open, it's no longer low hydrogen. It's it's absorbed moisture out of the air, and that moisture is water, and that water is hydrogen. You know, H2O, there's a lot of hydrogen in an oxygen mo molecule. So that's why water, we got to get out of it. Um, Oil-based paints, same way. All these things can cause weld failure. Um, I've welded on hydraulic parts that were still wet because we had to get something fixed, and you'd weld on them, you chip the slag, and like turn around and you could hear them cracking behind you because it was an over constrained joint and there was hydrocarbons in it and it wasn't going to work so we you know ground everything out multiple times cleaned everything out and finally got to work but we had to do a lot of work to get there so anyway um, watch all the videos come ready to ask questions um, I'll talk to you later